This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. It's uh, July 4th as we, as we record this. And, you know, it's an interesting July 4th because there's a lot of people, you know, not just libertarians this year, who are feeling that the government is oppressing them. You know, it's, so we'll talk about the Supreme Court. And we've, we've got some issues about the bureaucratic state. But before we get to that, there was an article in, um, I caught it off of MSN, but I think it was from The Hill. Um, National pride is evaporating in, uh, in America. There's, regardless of where you're at, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, your, your pride in America is slipping. And I guess we all have our own reasons for that. But it's, it's, a, it's a problem as we watch our uh, communities kind of dissolve. What's your thoughts on that, Richard? Pride goes before the call or something like that, or the fall. Uh, I, I, I can understand why American pride is uh, on the wane. Uh, I am a patriot in the sense that I love the idea of America. I love the idea uh, promulgated by the Declaration of Independence in particular and uh, to a lesser degree by the Constitution and, and the other founding uh, documents. The ideas that... Uh, America was founded on, which is uh, a, uh, a light government overseeing largely independent, self-sufficient uh, citizenry. That's pretty much gone by the wayside. We're becoming more and more like uh, the the tyrants that we threw off in old Europe. We're becoming much, much more, much more like like uh, European uh, socialized uh, democracies today. Uh, and ultimately, that's not a good thing because uh, all a socialized democracy can do is uh, take from one class of people to give to another class of people, uh, and skim off a lot for the for the bureaucracy in the in the process. Uh, so it doesn't make any difference whether you're left or right. You are paying a lot more for a lot less as the size of government and that bureaucracy continues to grow. Uh, if you take a look at some of the uh, the the census uh, statistics, you'll find that uh, something like, I think it's 18% of the federal budget goes to uh, to defense. That's way too much, but most people think it's like, you know, most of the, of the national budget. Not. Most of the national budget goes to uh, social welfare programs, primarily uh, Medicare, which I'm a recipient of, Social Security, which I'm a recipient of. I'm not going to turn it down, but I sure as hell would prefer not to have it and not to have paid into it for the last uh, 50, 60, however many years. So, you know, and, and we're, we're doing all of that by uh, on borrowed money. We're not taxing enough to pay for all of the benefits from the military to uh, welfare benefits, so you know, broadly defined to uh, all of the other uh, things that the government is trying to uh, provide for us, not paying for it, so the money is borrowed and the borrowed money finds its way into the financial economy initially, which jacks up stock prices, and then uh, eventually it jacks up all the prices, which is where we're at right now. You notice that uh, President Biden is not bragging about how the cost of a 4th of July cookout is lower this year than it was last year, and he won't for a few years probably. Uh, so people are feeling it, feeling the pinch economically at the pump, at the uh, uh, grocery store, and they're seeing Whichever side of the issue you're on, whether, uh, say, on, on abortion, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, you are uh, upset one way or another because you're, if, if you're um, pro-life pro, uh, pro or pro-choice, you're upset because of the reversal of Roe. If you're pro-life, you're upset because you're going to have to fight that same battle all over again at various state and local levels, primarily state levels. So... You know, it's it's a you know it's an every man against every other man, or every person against every other person kind of economy, and that does not bode well for uh, a sense of optimism. There's no longer a sense in the United States that we uh, can be optimistic in the sense that we have the opportunity to make ourselves better by providing uh, a product that other people want to buy and doing it at a better price than the guy down the street, because uh, industry in large part has been cartelized and regulated into uh, into super behemoths that uh, snuffle out any uh, upstart new businesses. And that's by design. It's by design of politicians in conjunction with uh, existing businesses 
not a good thing. It's, it's easy to understand why liberals don't like big business. It's easy to understand why conservatives don't like uh, the regulatory state. And, uh, and they're both right and they're both wrong. They're right in the sense that government's too big. Uh, and, and they're wrong in the sense that red or blue uh, electing is going to make any difference whatsoever because Republicans and Democrats are, co are complicit in the quandary that we find ourselves in. Yeah, and it's not just the economics. It's the economics and the political division has really seeped down into the society and our cultures in a way that I haven't seen before. You know, I'm 52 years old, so it's for, for the last 40 years, these political divisions didn't seem to interact into your living room or into your kitchen or into your sports leagues or into the, your, your community, right? The political divisions stayed in politics. And today, political divisions are in everything. It's in our entertainment. It's, it's in our businesses. It's in our homes. It, it's, and it's very hard to be proud of the communities you, you're, you're a part of when you're fighting each other all the time. I mean, how, how can you be proud of that? How can you literally be proud when you're just continually fighting constantly over every little thing i mean we we literally fight over everything now and it's and it's become while it's understandable because you know as we talk about the bureaucratic state you know you literally can't do anything you can't even work the way you want anymore be gig workers um be, the supreme court has uh dealt a blow to uh truckers and those of us who used to be gig workers at base gig workers you know so california's ab5 is now you know, they didn't offer any relief to the truckers in California AB5. So now we're going to have our, the trucking problem is going to be worse here in California because truckers are going to go. And anyway, it's very hard. I can actually understand why there's a, such a difficulty in having pride in your, in your country when your country doesn't have pride in you, essentially. They, can't, they don't trust you to do your, to go along and take care of yourself. And it's hard to have pride in yourself or your country when that's, when that's the case. It's just, I, so I don't know, Richard, it doesn't surprise me, but I don't know what to do about it because this whole system is kind of, we're watching it, we're watching it collapse around our, our eyes and it's, you know, you're watching our society collapse around your eyes and you're, you're hoping that we can build like a Phoenix, you can build something better after, after the ashes, but man, it's just, it's hard to feel, <laughs> it's hard to feel encouraging. It's hard to feel encouragement for the future on this kind of a circumstance. Well, I mean, we, Economies, uh, cultures operate in cycles, and so we're in a very, uh, at, the, at the probably just past the the top of a very long uh, positive cycle, and uh, the uh, the arc down toward the uh, the bottom of a negative cycle. It'll take a while, and uh, the only people who will survive are the people who say, "Okay, this is what the system says I have to do. This is what I need to do in order to survive and thrive," and they do the latter. Uh, kind of flying under the radar, which becomes much much more difficult uh, with the uh, the surveillance state having something to say about that. Yeah, the surveillance state, but there is some kind of good news. The uh, Supreme Court put the brakes on kind of the uh, robust EPA uh, actions that they've been doing, kind of passing laws without even discussing Congress. I suppose the EPA is no longer allowed to do that, which is supposed nice, but Congress is just going to pass the laws, so I'm not entirely sure what a long term is going to do. Well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, as a, as a uh, former guest on uh, Libertarian Counterpoint, former colleague of mine, now head of the Goldwater Institute, said Tim Sandifer said he he he, he, he uh, paraphrased it or, or explained it very simply. Congress critters are elected to do good things for the people. They, they promise, you got a problem, I'll come up with a solution. I will do a good thing to fix. Fill in the blank: pollution, uh, inequality, uh, you know, the fact that your in-laws don't like you, whatever it is. And so they pass a law that says, "Do a good thing," and they enable a bureaucratic agency to carrying carry out their law of doing a good thing. Uh, the EPA was passed saying, "Do a good thing. Clean up our, you know, about cleaning up our our water and our air." And essentially, the law said, it's up to you how you do it. You figure it out. You're the experts. Uh, you figure out how to uh, to clean up all this stuff. We're giving you essentially carte blanche. That's because politicians don't want the uh, fingerprints on the negative aspects of uh, what has to be done or what may have to be done in order to, to uh, 
to change the status quo. When it comes to air pollution, nobody wants uh, filthy air. Nobody, absolutely nobody. Uh, and the reason it exists, it's a neighborhood effect. The reason it exists is because uh, it's, it's cheaper to ignore uh, the pollution that's coming out of the tailpipe or off the, up, the, uh, up the, uh, the smokestack than it is to, uh, to fix it. And, and, and for, for competitive reasons, people don't fix it. But when you enable the EPA to come up with uh, solutions, quote unquote, uh, they come up with some of the damnedest, craziest things that you can possibly think of that may or may not work. We've seen it uh, very, very explicitly how how smart experts are with the, the way they handled the pandemic. Like, not at all. Like, you know, uh, had adverse effects. Everything that the federal government did seemed to, to backfire and make the whole system, the whole situation worse. That's what's happening to a large extent with a lot of these regulations. And you've got bureaucrats who are protected by civil service rules and, and in essence, and essentially cannot be fired. So they're in it for life. They don't care whether or not the rules that they make up are effective. The Congress critters can say, well, it's not my fault. The, it, you, go talk to the, to the bureaucrats. They're the ones that are messing things up. The president can say, well, you know, I, I tried to, I'm, I'm replacing people at the top, but I can't get rid of the civil service employees. And they're all right, but they're all wrong because they, and they, they set the system up in that way in the first place. Now, what the, uh, what the EPA suit does, in effect, is it reverses or starts to chip away at the Chevron doctrine and a few other uh, doctrines, Lochner, a few other doctrines, uh, Supreme Court presidents, that make it real easy for Congress to delegate rulemaking authority. Ultimately, I think what Gorsuch and others uh, in the new majority want to do is they want to say to, uh, the, to, the, to Congress, if you want a law that says, uh, in the in the environmental case, it was about cap and trade. If you want a cap and trade law, you Congress write that law. Don't delegate it to somebody that don't have that can't be fired and don't have any uh, personal stake in the game. You do it yourself. And if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, then you change the law to something that may in fact work. But write the law. In fact, there's a there's a, an organization out there that says write you know that the campaigns for write the laws, read the bills. And, uh, and that's a great idea. Uh, make Congress do what they're supposed to do other than simply run for re-election perpetually. Well, what's interesting, on the 4th of July, when we're recording this, we actually forget there's a lot of the time we complain, we say that we re rebelled over taxes, but we actually didn't rebel over taxes. We rebelled over the way the taxes were implemented. They actually didn't care all that much about the tax money. They cared about having the the new tax system imp 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 what I was what I'm looking for. Um, enforced on them, you know, in just enforced without any choice. It was taxation without representation was the actual was the actual complaint. And here with the EPA and these rogue, call them rogue agencies, you have the same the same problem is where the average person has no representation in these agencies, right? Because the the system set it, the politicians set it up that way, so they don't have to be accountable. Hey, look, stuff is happening, but it's not our fault. <laughs> But yes, yeah, and, your and, the, and, the, and the taxes are in effect indirect because they don't actually most of, most of the time they don't actually levy a tax. They just uh, change the rules of the game in such a way that the cost of doing business increases dramatically. Will those changes in the rules and the way uh, businesses uh, do business help be helpful as far as the environment is concerned? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, that's an empirical question. Uh, but what's not an, an empirical question is that Congress escapes the blame if it goes badly uh, and reaps the praise if it actually works. Unfortunately, Congress is not reaping a lot of praise lately. No, because none of it works. <laughs> it's hard to reap praise when everything is broken. <laughs> well, talking about being broken, Jeff Bezos, you know, apparently is now uh, upset with the uh, with Joe Biden, geez, I'm, ha I'm having a Joe Biden day here. I can't think of the words I want. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Bezos is upset with Joe Biden complaining about the, the high gas companies for the high prices of gas. Now, this is really interesting because Jeff Bezos is a big lefty. He's the owner of the Washington Post, right? He's He's been covering Biden's butt for a long time. And apparently this is the step too far. I just, you know, we can't ignore basic economic realities or what. But it's an interesting sign that, you know, at least... On occasion, these people who cover these the butts of these politicians will occasionally go out and say, "Hey, look, this is just so stupid. Even I can't agree with it." It's 
Well, yeah, and and you know the, the the cost of gas is going up. Everybody knows it. Everybody uh, is not happy with it. Uh, and Biden has been grasping at straws, trying to figure out who to blame. Well, there's two places to put blame on on the, the price of gas. One place is just inflationary pressures caused by Fed money printing. That's primary. Without the enabling printing of new money uh, by le lending new money into the into the banking system and uh, financing federal debts and federal overspending and uh, subsidies to consumers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Without that, without the enablement of the Fed, there would be no inflation. It would not be, would not uh, physically be possible to occur. That that's just a number one. You can't have inflation without the Fed providing the money for it to take place. You'll have changes in the volatility or the, the velocity of money from time to time, but those don't last uh, particularly long, and they they'll, they'll reverse themselves and self-correct. But when you have long-term, consistent inflation, it's like Milton Friedman does uh, said, it's it's ultimately a monetary situation. Uh, so he's never, ever, Biden has never, ever admitted any uh, complicity on the part of the Fed. The, he's, you know, he's got the Fed's back. In fact, he reappointed Jerome uh, Powell, the guy that engineered the last wave of money printing. So, you know. There, there's no 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 taking of, of responsibility whatsoever for the actual cause of inflation. The secondary cause of inflation, when it comes to gas prices, is that is the the, the whole uh, slave slavish uh, addiction to the the new green policy, the green new, new green wave or whatever they call it. Uh, the first day in office, I think it was the, the Biden administration shut down the Keystone pipeline, which is ready to go live. Uh, the Keystone pipeline would have brought. Uh, oil from Canada to the United States to be refined in the United States and uh, in a very safe way. Pipelines are are hugely much more uh, safe to the environment uh, than, than shipping oil by rail or any other way. Uh, rail or tanker doesn't make any difference. Pipelines are uh, the blue, the, the gold star way of shipping oil without environmental damage. But it was shut down anyway because, hey, it's oil. Uh, so you did that, and then the second thing he's done is he's not uh, not made it possible for people to uh, uh, explore for oil on public lands. He's th thrown all kinds of uh, monkey wrenches in, into that process. And the third thing he's done is he's uh, uh, paid lip service to all of the Green New Deal uh, uh, rhetoric, which tells oil exec executives, why the hell should we be investing uh, in oil wells, why should we, we be investing in refineries? And refineries are key. The number of refineries has gone down dramatically over the, the number of the, the, the refinery capacity has gone down dramatically over the last uh, couple of decades. Why? Because the oil executives are saying we're not going to invest in a long term, uh, make a, a long term billion or trillion dollar investment if our whole business model is going to get shut down like the politicians are threatening to do by 2035 or 2050 or whatever they're saying. So refinery, the number of refineries are, is going down. That's construct, or constricting the amount of uh, amount of fuel that actually gets uh, distributed. So you've got uh, you've got shutting down uh, supply on one end, and you've got raising the amount of money on the other end. Why do you think prices are going up? It's real simple. It's not because of Putin. It's not because of uh, the gas companies overcharging. It's because of government malfeasance from A to Z. I don't even want to call it malfeasance. They've they've actually told us in the last 15, 20 years that they want high gas prices. They want them. The oh, political yeah, left yeah. wants the high gas prices to force us out of our cars and into public transport. And they're happy about it. And so they're just, or in, or in the they're just pretending. They're pretending to care. And you can actually you can actually save it. I caught this, what was it? On there was a Biden administration on TV. I caught a clip. That he says, well, these high prices are just here to stay. We're just going to have to. This is the way that it is, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Essentially, yeah. To, to enforce, get this: the new liberal order. Yes, the new. That's what it was. See, you caught these. I'm having my Biden brain is kicking in today. Jesus, I mean, the Christ. new liberal order. I mean, that's that's an, that's a a much more honest interpretation of the new world order uh, under G. W. Bush. Uh, we've we've got the uh, the masks coming off of the elites who would. Uh, rule every aspect of our lives given half a chance. Well, and that brings us to our next one. It's uh, how much should the government know about what you're you're doing? How much you're moving around? We have these politicians who like to say they're protecting us from the marketers, right? We need to protect your information, right? Protect your data, which is 
in the open market, your individual data is completely worthless. It's about worth about 10 cents. <laughs> it's not, your actual data isn't worth anything. But the mark, I'm not afraid of marketers. I'm not. I'm afraid of a rogue FBI, the rogue CIA, <laughs> all these other people putting these dots together that don't exist because, you know, I live a strange life. And now all of a sudden I'm under some goofy investigation or on some another list <laughs> because the government is watching me, but they're going to protect me from those marketing people who are going to try to sell me a new shoes or a new hard drive or whatever. Now, I don't get it. Well, I don't get why everybody's upset. Yeah. You know, Protecting people against marketing is just uh, like just cover for the crime of spying on you. I've got a T-shirt that says uh, the NSA is the only uh, uh, bureaucracy that actually listens to you. Uh, and, <laughs> well, it's probably true. <laughs> they really are. The only ones who care in what you say. It, it, it's just I don't understand why so many people are upset about this whole data thing, but then they just turn a blind eye to what Eric Snowden and all these, and what these people have, sh we've shown time and time again, that the government breaks their own rules and eh, they don't care. They just keep going on about it. And yeah, we're talking about them. living in a country their horns, and they, they law, do. but every citizen has always lived under the rule of law. The difference between the Americans rule of the United States rule of law was the government was supposed to live under the same rule of law. The government and the politicians were supposed to live under the same rule of law as the people, and that is simply no longer the case, if it ever actually was. But Well, ostensibly it's still the case, but it's a, a case with a whole lot of loopholes and, uh, and uh, escape hatches and, and other ways of avoiding it. Uh, witness how uh, little attention uh, Nancy Pelosi's drunk husband got for getting a DWI. I think it, uh, he may have even gotten off, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the point is, you know, we have a, we have a a system where we have two levels of law enforcement. We've got one level of law enforcement for people who are anti-government in one way or another, uh, and they'll be spied on and uh, and eavesdropped on and surveilled uh, till forever uh, in order to find dirt on them. And, the, and with so many laws in the United States, it's not that hard to find dirt if you've got unlimited listening and, and spying capacity, which the federal government does. Uh, then, there's the, then there's the people who, uh, who uh, run the agencies, or work, for, work in Congress or in, or in the administrative agencies, and somehow or another, they escape all of the, uh, all of the drag nets. And they just pretty much do what they please uh, because they're not surveilled on because, hey, they're part of the club and you're not. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not part of the club. Well, speaking about... Uh, part of the club. We'll move on real quick to the end. Mark Zuckerberg has what they called an original idea for getting rid of employees, though, quite frankly, it's not an original idea at all. <laughs> but he says he's turning up the production pressure. And if you don't long, no longer want to work here, it's if you don't like the new environment, the new work environment, it's okay by him. Well, that that's kind of like how places have always worked, right? If you don't fit into the work environment, it's your problem, not the work environments. Right now, yeah, well, increase the workload, and if you don't like it, you know, there's the door. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, that's how places of business have always kind of worked. You either work at the place, you know, and you you enjoy the the work environment that that place has, and you know, the culture, the work culture that place has, or you find some place that has a different culture. Right? That's how these things have worked. But I guess I don't know. Has tech really become that disassociated with the real life that? You know, these people in tech and Facebook and down in the Bay Area, they just have to go to work. And but are they? what are they doing? <laughs> well, they're doing a very, you say our data is not worth anything. But if you take a look at uh, the uh, the reality, our data is worth a hell of a lot because you get Facebook for free. You get Gmail for free. You get uh, YouTube for free. You get uh, Google search for free. If you're getting something for free, you're the product. Yeah, and I don't mind being the product. I, don't and, mind, and I want to know yeah. how all these workers and, and you and you as a product are worth a lot to the market. Yeah. The people who want to buy targeted advertising, uh, you have all had the experience where if you go on the internet and shop for a pair of uh, I don't know baby shoes, you all ultimately you all, immediately within within seconds you get bombarded with baby shoe ads. Yeah, uh, you know, and that's because they're selling data to people they know have an interest in whatever uh, the seller wants to uh, to advertise. Uh, that increases the uh, effective effectiveness of the advertising. Uh, you know, it can be up to a hundred thousand dollars or more per click 
per click, even if you don't buy anything to an advertiser, depending on, on what the product is. So, uh, you know, it's a very efficient advertising model. It's what's driven newspapers out of business. Radio stations are uh, having a hard time. TV stations are having a hard time uh, because the Internet uh, has a much more efficient uh, advertising model. They're not broadcasting to a mass market. They're broadcasting to a micro market that has expressed an interest specifically in what it is the uh, the advertiser is trying to sell. So you know it's, it's a model that uh, that works. And there's the uh, the uh, economy of scale. Uh, the uh, I forget there's a, a term for it. Once you have uh, more or less a de facto monopoly on a marketplace like Google has on search, like Facebook has on and Twitter have on social. Uh, once you have uh, that much market presence. Uh, it makes it much more difficult for, oh, I don't know, MySpace, remember them, to uh, to actually compete because everybody everybody's on FaceTime. Now, I understand that that's not the case with younger people anymore, and that's good, but, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's... Well, uh, everybody used to shop at Sears until they didn't, right? And until yeah. Walmart came around, and it, it took it took a while for, for Sears to go away. But, you know, it eventually went away. And Facebook will eventually go away unless it adapts. And they're trying to adapt, and we'll see how well that works, you know? I, you know, we all have our have our skeptics, but it's just surprising me that they have that many employees. Where the solution is, ah, oh, we're just going to turn up the, the, the workload. <laughs> well, what have these people been doing? Well, I tell you what they've been doing is they've been policing the uh, content to make sure there's nothing in there that's either libertarian or conservative that at all parrots the uh, the uh, new world liberal order party line. Yeah, there must be a lot of there must be a lot of fat in those in the Facebook bureaucracy. I, I'm guessing it, it's what they're discovering here. There's a lot of people who don't. Well, I don't want to say diversity hires because that's probably not exactly accurate. But there's a lot of people who are probably you know space wasters, as uh, Elon Musk called them at Tesla. He got rid of them at, down at Tesla too. All of these all these people who got hired to fill quotas are now going to be the first ones to get booted out. So, you know. You, you you either make money for the company or you don't, right? That's that's the, that's the key here. So we've got I don't know forty seconds, Richard. You want to? So you got a closing thing for a closing thing for fourth. Yeah, my closing thought is uh, whatever you do, remain optimistic. Don't give up hope. The idea of America will live, and it will live forever because it's the idea of liberty, the idea of personal autonomy, personal responsibility. And uh, being willing to uh, go the extra mile to achieve something that benefits humanity, uh, and if you can do that, uh, you'll be su- you'll be successful. It's much more difficult now that you have to stumble over a bunch of government roadblocks, but it's not impossible, and uh, it's uh, something that everybody needs to aspire to if they want to remain happy and sane. And with that, is a good message to leave us on. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all for watching us. We'll see you next week. And please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for The Libertarian Counterpoint.